Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to another week of the Halaqan, the Hikam. Uh, Grace is not here again. The official story is she went to go visit her parents. Um, we don't have we don't have any confirmation of that. We we're not even sure if they exist. I've never seen pictures of them, but that's what she tells us. And she leaves, and we end up having to fend for ourselves. But alhamdulillah, it's been it's been okay. I just wanted to apologize on behalf of the Asuri Institute for this last Friday's khutbah. Um, we received a lot of complaints. Uh, that uh, the the content was problematic, that the speaker himself was obnoxious and inarticulate, but um, alhamdulillah, we're working on it. Um, uh, his name was uh, Cherif Abu al Fadl. has the same last name as you. Do you, do you know him, Sheikh? Yes. Oh, oh, your son. Oh, okay, so I mean, it's, this is awkward. Um, so you can't speak your honest opinion about the khutbah, I imagine. So uh, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, anyways, we're working on it, and uh, inshallah next week it'll be something acceptable. Um, and uh, no, no, folks, I will not be giving a khutbah. I know that we're getting a lot of requests. There's been a lot of demand for a khutbah by Rami, but uh, we're not there yet. Um, so uh, without further ado, al-hakam al-ata'iyah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, subhanallah al-Ali al-Azim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammad. Wa ala alih wa ala ashabih wa ala man attaba'u bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen. اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي عمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي يا رب العالمين. طيب we left off at depending on the the text sixty three or sixty two um. No, uh, 61 or 62, depending on the text. أنت حر مما أنت عنه آيس وعبد لما أنت له طامع which I said that um, although the, the translation I have here says in your despairing you are a free man and in your coveting you are a slave. It's more accurately translated as um, you are free as to anything that you do not covet and you are enslaved by anything that you covet. And the, there is the rather straightforward meaning to this in relation to material things. And it is a very central ethic uh, that is emphasized for sojourners on this path because as, as I have noted many times, Al-Hakam al is supposed to be a program. It's supposed to be studied as a chronological program of progress where you take one principle after the other and work on it in a process of elevation. Um, and the, the core ethic and the rather obvious one from from the the, the the language is to defeat to defeat your dependence on material things, whatever these material things are. Um, but there is.
th there is a nuance to this principle that is well captured by a, a statement that you memorize and you be um, uh, which goes something like "Nola atma'in kaziba lama stu'abid al-ahrar." That, but had it not been false hope for hope, false for desires, had it not been for false um, dependencies, um, free human beings would not have been enslaved. And the reason I emphasize this and this nuance of, or that shade of meaning, if you will, is because I really do believe that when whatever captured the imagination of human beings in any dynamic activist social movement throughout human history whatever was sort of the engine that energized the creative juices of human beings that got human beings to uh, represent a paradigmatic shift in history. It was always, it was always a shade of liberty, meaning that it, it, what it, liberty is not something absolute and it's not something you can define in the abstract. It, it, it's liberty was always a, a a a relational concept. Uh, what so. what counted as liberty depended on the historical circumstance, but what always excited the human imagination was a sense that they are liberating themselves from something. And that had always been what motivated social movements and re revolutionary change throughout history. That relative sense, again, you can only understand it from the, from the perspective of a historian. Because if you measure it in the absolute and you read the history with um, sort of an, 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 uh, an imperialistic uh, eye of wanting history to yield to the standards of one day and one age, then you won't understand why people thought certain ideas and certain concepts and certain movements and certain circumstance were liberating for them in history. Because with imperialistic eyes, you, you, you judge everything according to your own specific historical circumstance and you see nothing liberating in the relative um, circumstance in social history. But that idea is, is, is an essential one. And because what made Islam exciting in its historical circumstance, what was truly liberating were for Muslims was precisely this idea that um, 
it's captured in another statement. Whoever is a true slave to God is free as to all else. And this idea of being free as to all else is what excited the Muslim imagination and what made Islam exciting as a liberating movement. And again, if Muslims were writing their own history, when, when, you, when your history is being written by the other, the other is always looking at your history with the assumption, whether it's conscious or, or, or unconscious, it doesn't matter that their own history is the triumphant history. Your own history is basically a, an explanation of why you didn't triumph like they did. And that assumption is constantly there as they are reading the history of the other. And so you find no narrative in Islamic history that talks about the way that Islam, there, there's a lot of historians that sit there and puzzle over why Islam spread so quickly, why Islam uh, was such a victorious force, why Islam was such an exciting uh, faith at the, um, 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 in this century and that century and so on. But you will, I am not aware of, with very, very, very few exceptions, I mean, a handful, less even than a handful, uh, uh, historians that you know had the, the, the guts, the gall, to come out and say, well, because Islam was a liberating force in its time and place, the idea that Islam came with that you are a abd to Allah that you are a slave to God and therefore you are free from you, your, your inherent state is a state of freedom as to all else and that hurriya and izza hurriya freedom and izza dignity go together that even if your legal status is one of a, that of a, of a mawla or a slave but still you are entitled to morally, to Hurriya and Aiza, was a, a radical and a revolutionary idea. And yet, less than a handful of historians um, dared say, well, yes, what made Islam so exciting and what, what and Islam was a, 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 a transformative moment in history because of these idea, ideas about, the reason I emphasize this is that there is, again, in the same way that we saw attention in, um, in the aphorism before about what al-wahm is, what, um, what counts as a, um, how do, did we translate it? Um, well, it says, that nothing deceives you as false, what you falsely covet, or uh, what uh, the deceptions of material dependence. And in the same way that I emphasized last Hanukkah, that this aphorism can quickly become uh, an excuse to for lethargy and uh, disinterest in the ethical principles of Islam. Similarly, when we talk about al-abd al-hur, what, what freedom is, for this aphorism, there is a tension that you see in um, 
throughout the, the history of Sufism, there is, there is one tendency within the history of Sufism and, with, and I think within the history of all of Islam where basically you say what well, this aphorism or this, this whole concept of Hurriya and Abudiya uh, challenges you to is to become disinterested in material things and to become disinterested in material progress and that freedom is simply a spiritual freedom. So, and if you read a lot of the literature that, uh, that, that, you, the, the, that tendency is clearly there, where you basically say um, it, it doesn't matter that if you care about social justice or you care about um, social ethics generally, um, that, that's seen in itself as as a form of awudi, as a form of uh, being enslaved by human values. And then the emphasis becomes so heavily on simply detachment from worldly affairs and Oops. sort of inward looking to the point that you cave in, you sort of collapse inward so thoroughly and so completely um, that freedom becomes a selfish individualistic venture. That you're so literally, you you know, as we you could have an Andalus being lost or Baghdad being sacked, and you're you go around talking about I uh, not Muslims are free, but I am free, and that I am, and th this is the way I was trained. And, and the, the school of thought that I was raised in. If you are able to say, I am free, but your people are not free, then that is an indulgence and a selfishness. The I, the way in, in the school of thought I was raised in, the I is the devil. I is Satan, Satan's self. The, the, to say, well, it, it I'm not concerned if Muslims are free or not free because I am free. The, the employment of the I and your sense of satisfaction because of the I is in itself the ultimate form of indulgence and how and whimsicalness. So, so part of that ethic, that liberating ethic of freedom, has to do, and, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, people who have who have experienced authoritarian societies will. will know what I'm talking about more than people that have never experienced authoritarian societies. So much of, in my view, in my opinion, so much of human progress and human creativity depends on individual initiative. And individual inspiration if the individual matters so that the individual maintains the ability to be 
creative, to add value, freedom becomes far more meaningful when individuals are muted. So the only thought that comes and the only inspiration that comes and the only voice that comes and the only speech that comes is from the top of the pyramid and everything below the pyramid simply mirrors the top of the pyramid. That's literally when you have social deaths. And you'll understand in a second why I'm emphasizing this because of when we get to the point about Adab, where all of this becomes particularly important. So, and, I, and if you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet, what is remarkable is that you had at the top of the pyramid a prophet, a man that receives divine inspiration, not a claim of divine, of not some, you know, roundabout claim of being divinely guided somehow, as a lot of leaders do, where they 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 intimate that whatever they do is the will of God, and but you actually have a prophet, but yet that prophet. The only way you can describe what he did to his close companions, the only way you can describe what he did vis-a-vis -vis his close companions is that he liberated them. I mean, study any of the companions, whether, whether that companion is someone who ultimately had a glorious record or someone who at one point or another messed up. It doesn't matter. But what you can clearly say is that each individual companion became a force unto themselves, man or woman, to the extent that you have books on a Sahabi yet and you can, we just don't learn about the Sahabi yet. These are the women companions. And each one of them is a full-fledged personality that contribute, contributed individually. So their relationship to the leader, to the prophet, empowered them, not disempowered them. So Ubudiyya Lillah did not mean that self-denial before the leader or self-effacement before the leader, because this is such a critical point. So many Muslims think that Ubudiyya Lillah means that the leader comes and says, well, if you were a true Muslim, then you would not care about your own personal opinion, and you would just follow my opinion because I am the leader. That is a, a, a immoral failure in understanding what Islam is about. Your relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala empowers you individually, as to your teacher or as to your leader, it doesn't self-efface you as to your teacher or as to your leader. And this is why what the Prophet ﷺ did to the people he came to, he turned every individual companion, to, so, so much so that some of them, you know, those who, when you think of someone, those who went as far as an Andalus, who had been cut off from the older sources of inspiration, and yet acting individually, they were able to become a living, breathing invitation for Islam wherever they went. I, I mentioned this, was this last halakha when I said I was in the nursery and I saw all the stickers? Yeah, you know, 
in the society I was raised, the idea that you teach a child that I am important, I matter, uh, I, I am wonderful, I am happy, or I am great, or uh, was, I mean, our, our teachers, basically, in 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 the society I was raised in, our teachers told us basically that you don't matter. You you you, you shut up. You keep your mouth shut. You, if you're really good, then you're really obedient and you're not heard. You, you, if you have an opinion that is, is different from what the teacher says, or if you have an opinion that is different from what the teacher tells the class to think, you are considered deviant and you're punished for that opinion. That, in my view, is the loss of Islam itself. It's not just an authoritarian culture, but it is the, the death of Islam. I, I emphasize this because you find this in all of our Islamic centers in the United States, all Islamic centers created and led by Arabs and Indo-Pats mirror that same authoritarian ethic that Ubudiyah is used as a leverage to, for mediocrity, for flattening the playing field, for saying that let's just all sound the same way, let's all think the same way, let's all be mirrors of one another, and that is a fundamental corruption of what al ubudiyya lillah is. al ubudiyya lillah, true, being a true abd, and I don't, I, mean, don't, I don't like the word slave because of all the connotations that it carries. Abd is, 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 is an honorific term. In, in my ubudiyya, you know, the the Abdul Qawm that the, the, the person who, who who serves a people is their master. It's a it, it, it's very ill served by the term slave. So and you see this very this tension that I'm talking about very clearly in, for instance, the debates between as Sanusiya and Omar Mukhtar. As Sanusiya initially resisted the Italian occupation in Libya, but eventually made peace with the Italians and basically advocated the concept of well, you know, uh, uh, as long as the Italians allow you to eat and drink and 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 the the clashes between Omar Mukhtar and some of the I mean, a lot of the discourses, unfortunately, were were lost between people like Omar Mukhtar and his Sanusiya, and especially in Omar Mukhtar's trial when he was captured and he brought. Uh, the head of the Sanusiya to, to court to testify against Omar Mukhtar. And Omar Mukhtar's responses when, said, uh, when uh, I forgot the, the name of the head of the Sanusiya fellow, who was telling Omar Mukhtar at trial that if you truly understood what Ubudiyya is, you would have not rebelled against the Italians. And the responses of Omar Mukhtar, precise, when he says basically, if you truly understood what Islam is, you would have no, had no option but to rebel against the Italians. That if you were a, a true abd lillah, then anyone that seeks to subjugate you is, becomes an offense against your relationship to Allah, against your abudiyya lillah, and therefore you would have no option but to rebel. It's, it's some of the most fascinating the, the same, again, if we, I mean, I've read, uh, some Algerian historians have, but not enough, because it's not studied enough, 
the debates between the supporters of Abdel Qadr al Jazali, because what the French did was they were extremely troubled by the theology of Sufis like Abdel Qadr al Jazali. And the Orientalists, there was a very strong tradition of French Orientalism that advised them that Sufism could be a friend and that in Sufism you could have all your desired goals of complacency and surrender and um, basically those who are going to tell the Algerian people uh, obey the French because they are Allah's will and Allah's destiny and the and so what the French did was go to various imma in, in Algeria and get them to issue fatawa about how Abdul Qadr al-Jazairi and his supporters and those influenced by him are um, deviants and are um, uh, corrupting Islam and, you know, sinning and, and so on. For Some of this, Abdul Qadr Jazari and, and his followers, you know, write to, to a faqir like Rashid Rida in Egypt and they solicit fatawa. But there is an internal discourse generated by Algerian supporters of Abdul Qadr Jazari that again, if we were in command of our own history, you would have found dozens and dozens of studies on this, but we're not. Uh, the same thing in Egypt. One of the um, in one of the most important episodes in Egyptian history and in Muslim history generally was when the French came as invaders. It is. It is a historical fact that Napoleon intentionally spread a rumor that he had converted to Islam because Napoleon had just sacked uh, the papacy, had just sacked Rome before he came to Egypt. And he sent a message to the Egyptians that, see, the proof that I'm a friend of Muslims is that I've just sacked Rome. And if I... Is everything okay? Oh. Uh, huh? Keep going. Oh. Uh, if, if I was not a friend of Muslims, why would I have sacked Rome? Now, of course, the idea of a, a secular anti, anti-Christian Christians was not something that Muslims were familiar with. And so there were, and, and, and remember that Napoleon invades Egypt with literally a small army of Orientalists. Orientalism had already been born. And some of these Orientalists be, went on to became, become the grandfathers of the whole Orientalist movements because after the French conquered Egypt, these Orientalists remained and wrote some of the earliest studies on Oriental societies, Muslim societies, um, that literally defined the whole field of Orientalism and so on. I mean, Edward Said talks about this in, in his book in, in some detail. But he does, what Edward Said does not talk about, he does not talk about this whole episode of Napoleon and the, the debate the intense debate that he triggered among Sufism was 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 dominant in Egypt at the time. It, it, I don't know a single Azhari Sheikh of any prominence that didn't belong to a Sufi order. So all the Azhari Sheikhs belonged to Sufi orders. Uh, and of, they were of one rank or another. Napoleon comes, and there is a political division. There are those who believe 
that Napoleon did convert to Islam and the, that he came as a liberate because he says, I came to liberate you from the oppression of the Ottomans and give you freedom, your freedom as Muslims. And there are those who believe this conversion story, but French historians greatly exaggerated yes. the number of Egyptians that actually believed Napoleon's conversion story. That that is greatly exaggerated, and it was sort of a stereotyped. Um, uh, uh, and the proof is in, in the in the rebellion that eventually led to the bombardment of Azhar, right? So there is a more fundamental debate. Uh, do the French come? Uh, they come as conquerors, but do they? Do we have now that they have landed on our shores? Do we have, does every Sufi tariqa, the every head of a Sufi tariqa, do they owe an obligation to tell the students to join the resistance against the French or to obey and submit? And the, the thing that complicates things further is that the French, uh, especially after the Battle of Atel Kabir and the, the, the French used technology, technology that the Ottomans had not seen before and the Egyptians had not seen, and they're able to win the battle because of their technological um, edge and the, the technological advancement in warfare. But there is something that I, I learned also from the battle of, it is the risk, the, the in, The f and this remains, by the way, in, in, in the difference between the Western soldier and the native soldier. The native soldier is, is like a slave to the commander. The native soldier has no initiative, has no creativity. If, if, you, if you kill the commander of the native soldier, the native soldier becomes powerless and confused because they need orders. I have always been I, I let's put it this way I paid careful attention to the amount of self initiative of the officers serving under Napoleon they their self initiative reminds me of the self initiatives of muslim soldiers right after the period of the Prophet that self-initiative that comes from a sense of self-dignity and a belief in the self, a belief in your own creativity and your own abilities. Because there were many situations where Napoleon, uh, orders for Napoleon was, was not availing them and if, if you pay careful attention to the story, you, you're struck by the self-initiatives of these French soldiers and their, their belief that victory is theirs and that there is no way that they are can, they're going to be defeated, although they were greatly outnumbered. Anyway, but going back to the Islamic theological side, there is a fatwa issued by Azhar at the time that officially said Napoleon is Allah's will and your duty and obligation as a Muslim is to submit and obey. But the fact of the matter is most Sufi tariqas rejected the fatwa by, Azhar, by Sheikh al-Azhar and not only that but most Shiyukh al-Azhar rejected the fatwa by Sheikh al-Azhar of obedience. And joined into such a massive rebellion that, again, if we wrote our own history, we would all know that the French bombarded Al Azhar and, commi and committed one of the, 
I mean, it was the greatest massacre of Azhari Shiyukh in the history, in the 1,000 year history of Azhar. In, in order, and who they massacred, is they, they executed every sheikh that took part in the rebellion. But the, the conservative estimates, and this is a very conservative, is that 1,000 executions, and this doesn't count the number of sheikh that died when Azhar itself was bombarded. The, the number is is is, is, is so here's a car the, the Syrian historian has shown um, is likely f much higher than that. Sure. But the debates between those who were saying. Napoleon is Allah's will, and as long as Napoleon allows us to continue having our khamkas, our, our Sufi lodges, which Napoleon said, I'm not going to interfere with the Sufi lodges, because his Orientalist advisors told him, don't interfere with the Sufi lodges. The, the Sufism was such... A, a, a powerful force in Egyptian society, and, the, and his Orientalist advisors told him, you know, if you touch the the cover uh, of of the the the, the grave of uh, uh, Abu Mursi al Abbas, or the grave of Rithai, or the grave of the the, the great Sufi Sheikh, and that will enrage Egyptians that you. Uh, don't do whatever you do. Don't touch uh, their Sufi shrines and their Shufi, Sufi graves. At least that's uh, what the, his Orientalist advisors told, uh, told the, the the invading French forces. But the, the 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 debates and the discourses and the centrality of the idea of what Hurriya and what Izza means makes it so that you cannot take this aphorism and study this aphorism without very openly exposing that tension and talking about it. Because we also had that tension, I mean, but not to such, such an explicit extent in the Mongol invasions, I mean, there, there were a group of Muslims, there were a group of scholars who, and this is, again, we, we don't read about this because we don't know our history, but there were a group of scholars who entered the service of invading Mongol forces and acted as advisors to invading Mongol forces. And the theology of, well, you know, as long as you, you're, you are an aesthetic, or, or as long as your relation to relationship with Allah is solid, as if your relationship with Allah can be solid when you are betraying your fellow Muslims and helping in the oppression of your fellow Muslims. <laughs> Um, okay, one last example. Yeah. There was, you, you can look it up yourself, there was something called the Egyptian Expedientiary Force. The Egyptian Expedientiary Force played a uh, Allenby, Sir Allenby, the, the, uh, the British officer who conquered Jerusalem for Britain and the West, wrote a very well-known memo praising the role that the Egyptian expeditionary force played in the conquering of Jerusalem. These were 40,000 Egyptians who 
served the invading British army. So Allenby marches with his forces from New Zealand and his British forces and his soldiers from India, but he, he marches to conquer Jerusalem and there is an intense heated battle between Allenby's forces and Ottoman forces. The Egyptian force of 40,000 soldiers, according to Allenby, Allenby says, if it hadn't been for the hard work and the reliability of these 40,000 Egyptian soldiers, we would not have won the battle. Can you imagine I mean, a Muslim force, he is conquering Jerusalem, he is going to stand at the grave as he did. Allenby went to the grave of Salah al-Din and said, see Salah al-Din, we have returned. And as I said before, the bells in Rome and in Britain rung Protestant and Catholic because and, and, and headlines, and again, you can research this yourself, headlines, newspapers all over Europe celebrated the liberation of Jerusalem. But what no one, the part that everyone leaves out is that there were 40,000 Egyptian soldiers serving under Allenby. And that these 40,000 soldiers According to Allenby, the battle would not have been won without him. How do you get to the, can you tell me, can you imagine any scenario in which you can invade Britain and have a British force helping non-Brits conquer Britain? It's unimaginable. Why is it unimaginable? It's unimaginable because you know that you raise British people, you raise American people, you raise French people, you raise Danish people, it was a sense of dignity and self-initiative that they would individually know if I help a foreigner conquer my country, I'm a traitor. But these Egyptians, because I looked into whether they prayed or, and guess what? They were serving British forces, conquering Jerusalem, and they stood in Jama'a prayer. And there is even in the, in the, in the uh, records uh, uh, stuff about Allenby making sure that they had water for their wudu and that they had time to do their salah. And, uh, they, and when you look deeper, the whole thing is, was is that they were paid well by the British forces. That, that's what drew them in. But theologically, theologically, what these soldiers became convinced of, or what the fatawa they relied on, is that the, the invaders are the masters. And as the masters, they are the rulers. And because they are the rulers, they have to be obeyed because they are Allah's will. And that you no longer have an obligation to be free. Hurriya doesn't matter because Hurriya and Izza really are irrelevant for you. It's, we can't pass over these little... That's why history is so important. That's why when people like say, oh, why, why save manuscripts? And who cares about... Man? History is everything. If you don't learn from your history, you're going to repeat all the same mistakes again. If you don't invest in studying not just studying casually, in studying the nitty gritty of your history and deriving all types of lessons from your history and learning what are the mistakes that, what theological orientations, what systems of thought, what ideas, what 
narratives have played a dangerous role in subjugating you as a people, then, and, and, and if you think you, I mean, no religion on the face of this earth has underscored and emphasized to its followers the importance of studying past nations, i.e. history, than the Quran. Right? I mean, well, there is, I've, I've read them all. There is no other sacred book out there that invited, that actually, when Allah says, call siru fil ard, when Allah, when Allah says call, this is not a recommendation. This is a command. Allah is saying, study history as a command. This is not, you know, oh, if you have free time, do it. You know, if you, oh, please, you know, do it. It would be nice if you can. This is a, an affirmative religious command, an imperative. You must study your history. And I pause at something like the Egyptian exponentially force because I look at what's happening now in Gaza, for instance, and I sit there, and I, by the way, and the graves of the Egyptians that died in the British conquering of Jerusalem, their graves are still preserved. You can go still visit the graves of the Egyptians who died in the, and I sit there and I, and I think, What, would, what is the liability of the shiuch that issued fatawa to these Egyptian soldiers that they can take the British money and serve in the British army? How are they going to fare in the hereafter? Can you imagine? Could the Egyptian soldiers have imagined the decades of misery? Could they have imagined the Nakba? Could they have imagined the expulsion of Palestinians from their lands? Could they have imagined the Gazan genocide? Because they're responsible. They're responsible. They and their shiuch are responsible. They are the ones that maintain the supply lines for Allenby. And that's what Allenby says in his diaries. That it, the, these Egyptian soldiers were the ones that paved the roads that made sure the mules and the horses and whatever are fed and, and, and nourished and supplied, that acted as local guides, that provided all the translation service, that even took part in the fighting, that communicated that it, Allenby wanted to write to, to, by the way, air power also played a critical role in, in the British victory, as I've noted, several times, but Alan B, for, and some, something very simple, Alan B wanted to, to uh, encourage desertions among the Ottoman soldiers. So he goes to the Egyptian soldiers and he says, can you write a pamphlet for me that the planes can fly over where Ottoman soldiers are and we drop these pamphlets and in the pamphlets, can you talk about how well you are treated as Muslims? And they do. And they, you know, provide little niceties about how the 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 British allow them to pray this and and do do and remain Muslim and, and stuff like that. It it, it is. Of course, this is because it, at the time, Egyptians, there are a large number of Egyptians, new Ottomans, spoke Osmani. That, that's the part of, because, you know, there weren't just Arabic speakers, but because Egypt had been under uh, Osmani rule for so long, Ottoman was as common as English is now in, in Egypt. Anyway, but... I, I can't leave this, this concept of Hurriya without underscoring because 
if ubudiyah lillah is a double-edged sword. It can be either very liberating for human beings on this earth. It can be a constant rebellion against all forms of oppression. Or it can be, in fact, oppression itself. And in my view, it is whether the ubudiyah lillah becomes a form of enslavement or worship to someone or something or some institution that represents Allah. Okay. What, what time is it? Till it comes to you. Okay, or, or um, there is a in this in the context of this aphorism, there are a lot of narratives that you learn the art. I mean, when especially when you're young, I, I don't know if uh, one of the things that just stayed with me is. Um, she, you, I, I remember being told that Allah created birds to be free. Because in my, my shiuk taught me that uh, imprisoning a bird in, in a cage is haram. It's a sin. And that Allah created birds to be free. And then I, I just remember uh, being told, have you ever wondered how birds become enslaved and of course you know this is not necessarily accurate but for a child it, it was it sounded accurate that is, is it well it is because of the because someone exploited the coveting of a bird by putting out something that the bird thought was yummy and then when the bird tried to go eat it, the bird was captured and imprisoned. And so I was told, if you don't want to ever be captured and imprisoned, think twice before you covet. Anything that you, um, that you covet, think whether it would, it would be worth the the price would be worth your freedom if if it's going to imprison you then you don't want it and of course living by that is much harder than you know because if you think of everything in your life and you say is there a possibility that this is going to be my prison and if it is going to become my prison then i don't want it Sometimes it becomes quite a challenge, um, like, you know, s certain forms of professions, careers. Um, but it's an important refrain to have, and it's an important paradigm to always think through. Uh, at what point something has become my imprisonment? Because, and again, that ethic that as a Muslim, you are free in God. God created you free. God made you free to be free. And uh, there are many other narratives in this. Um, uh, there is a n narrative, and I think it's, I, I don't remember if it's in the Sharh, Hikam Atayya, or, but anyway, um, the, the student who uh, is, and there are many different, versions of it, but basically it goes something like this, that a, 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 a sheikh gives out, like in a lot of khan calls, the, the, um, a lot of zawiyas, the, 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 the um, students receive some type of food, and the food is usually something very modest. Anyway, so the sheikh is giving out the um, giving out bread to the students. And the, the she, all the sheikh can afford is, or all the sheikh can give out to the students in the zawiya is dry, hard bread with nothing else. So there is not, no, no cheese, no meat, no, nothing to eat with the bread. And 
a, a student objects to the sheikh and says, you know, why is it that we're all just eating dry bread, nothing else? And then the sheikh, I mean, th this is the version that I was taught, but again, there are many different versions of it. And then the sheikh says, okay, well, you, 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 want, to you, you want to understand uh, why you should be very grateful for this bread? And so they asked, they said, oh, you come with me. And then they take some and they go visit the ruler's prison. And he sees in the ruler's prison all types of people being tortured. The, you know, the different descriptions of graphic torture. And the sheikh, one by one, points out each person being tortured. And he said, this person coveted a rack of lamb. And then tells him a story about how the rack of lamb ended up with this person in prison being tortured. This person coveted a piece of bread that was soft and fluffy. And then tells him a story how that piece of bread ended up with this person in prison being tortured. And he goes through this, with a, and by the time the sheikh is done, of course, the student says, I'm very happy with my dry bed. You know, I, I don't want to be happy. Um, um, another thing I, I, that stayed with me, and again, I don't remember if it's in uh, Sharh, but... Um, Have um, any person who in, uh, to think of all things that you crave, all things that all material things that you crave that. But let me rephrase this. What you do need and you cannot do without is your hurriya, your freedom, and your izza, your dignity. And that your izza must rest upon Allah and nothing but Allah. That where does my dignity come from? It is not from a profession. It is not from my books. It's not from my money, it's not from my family, it's from, from Allah, because I am Allah's creature. And Allah says, as a human being, I'm entitled to dignity, so I am. Now, everything else is that I believe, I, am, I depend on, is a shackle around my leg. It's like a restraint. As you seek to come closer to Allah, everything you covet will hold you back. So you will try to reach out to Allah, but you will find yourself either moving very slowly because of the shackles or not moving at all. And uh, you will say, why is it that I'm reaching so fervently to Allah and not reaching, not communing? And the answer is, to the extent, to the extent there are shackles holding you back is your inability to commune with Allah. So the answer, if you want to commune, if you want to receive the blessings of the light, is to rethink the number of shackles and to break them deliberately one by one. But again, in my school, not to break your izzah, because that is from Allah, and not to give up your liberty, because that is from Allah. But your dependencies, anything of material nature that you depend on because that indeed it's it's like saying a true Allah is most receptive to us when we come to Allah truly free to the extent we come to Allah shackled and burdened 
are the barriers between us and Allah. And it's like, to the extent you liberate yourself, the more pure and full your communion with Allah will be. Okay, alhamdulillah, we just finished one aphorism, but at least we finished it. Uh, so, okay, that's, we're done, alhamdulillah. Um, Grace is not here to thank everyone and say close, but Robbie, do you want to do it? <clears throat> do you want to insult anyone else? I haven't insulted anyone. Okay. Uh, no, you, I, I saw you did. No. Not? I was just, I was just you know, relaying the complaints of all oh, the other people about the khutbah. Um, I'm not injecting my opinion in there at all. Uh, okay, alhamdulillah, thank you everyone. And that's it. <laughs> How, oh, mashallah, I'm very proud of you. That was very good, very eloquent. Yeah, tune in next week. We're, we're going to have a, even though it's, it's we're going to be close to Eid, no, it's still Ramadan. So we'll still be doing it. Uh, was it be Ramadan still? Yeah. When is Eid? Mm-hmm. When, Wednesday? Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's the last 10 days of Ramadan. <laughs>